So over the last couple weeks, I've been building out a geometry nodes tool that allows you to flow objects along any curve that you give it. It's become super useful and I'm really enjoying using it. So I decided to package it up, make the UI nice and put it on my gum road for free. If you've already downloaded it, great. If you haven't, go ahead and get it right now. If you don't know me already, I'm Warcat, and I just wanted to make this video as a bit of an explainer so that people can understand how to use this geometry nodes tool and implement it into your workflow. So that's about it, let's get into it. So just jumping into this default scene, um, first thing to go over is if you've never used geometry nodes before, this should make it super easy. All it is is a node tree and it's the same thing as appending a shader tree. All you need to do is go to file, append, and then in the file that you download, which will either be the flow along curves 3.4 fix, which is just if you're using Blender 3.4, or flow along curves v1. You go in here and then you go into the node tree and then curve flow append. That's all you have to do to get it in there. If you want it saved into your default scenes, all you need to do is open your default file, file, append, append the geometry nodes, and then just save that as the new startup file. All right, so first I'm going to add a curve here because this is the base for everything that the geometry nodes does. So I'm going to give it a bit of a bend here. Just kind of make a, make a nice S curve here. That works. I'm gonna go down here into the curve properties and I'm gonna set the resolution preview to 64. That's just gonna get rid of these jagged edges that can show up when you have really low interpolation values along this resolution. So I'm just gonna turn that up. And then all you have to do is go into the modifier tab, add a modifier, add a geometry nodes, and then in your dropdown, select curve flow. Now disregarding this behemoth of a node tree, you won't need to focus on that at all. All you'll need to do is first make a collection of the things that you want to scatter along this curve and flow along it. So I'm going to add an icosphere, I'm gonna add a cube, and let's say a cone. So I'm gonna take these three objects, just select all three of them, and hit M, and add them to their own collection. I'm gonna call it bits. So now bits is here in my outliner and I can just check that off because we don't want to render it or at least we don't want to render the base collection. We just want to see what is going along the curve. Now go back into your modifier and you're going to set the collection that we are instancing as bits and already it's working. Now I'm gonna go over a couple of things in this modifier and I'm gonna go just from top to bottom because I just want you to understand what the parameters are actually doing so that if you change a setting and something breaks, you're not gonna be completely blindsided by why that's happening. So first thing I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna turn the scale down. Uh, this is pretty self-explanatory down here. It's just the scale of the instances uh, and this is the randomization value. So if you, zero means you don't randomize it one means it is random from a scale of zero to one. Pretty simple. Now I'm gonna set the scale down to 0.1 just cause that's what's gonna work for us here. Now, what this does is it takes in your base curve and it makes a bunch of duplicate curves and offsets them randomly with noise. And then it places the instances on those curves at different points. That's kind of the backbone of how this thing works. So up here in curve controls, curve count is quite literally how many curves you're generating for these things to go along. So if I go down here, scroll down and hit debug view, we can actually see these curves. So if you ever have a problem and you're not really sure where it's stemming from, this can help you kind of figure out what might be happening. Um, I'm gonna leave this on for now and I'm going to up the curve noise. Now what the curve noise does is this is telling us how much of the noise do we actually want to multiply their positions by? How much do we want to offset them? It's the same as the value in like a displace modifier. Now you can see they're just kind of expanding pretty, pretty mellow. Like there's not, there's not a whole lot of variation going along here. And that's because what it's doing is it's going to offset the points. And if your curve has a very small amount of points, it's going to be 
pretty smooth and it's not going to have a lot of noise within the curve because it doesn't have anything to displace. Now you can do this by either going into that hell of a node tree and resampling your curve, or you can do this and just subdivide what you need off the curve and you can get a little bit more variation here. And now as I up the resolution of the curve inside of edit mode, you can see it starts to have a bit finer displacement along said curve. Now if I up the curve noise amount by a lot and I want it to be super random, now you can see that we're starting to get really sharp jaggies right here. And the cause of that is just because the curve is not adjusting the Bezier points properly. And the workaround I've found for that so far is just this smooth curves checkbox, which switches all of the points in your curves to automatic in instead of aligned splines, which just automatically makes them smooth. So now you can see we have these nice sweeping curves here. And I'm gonna turn off debug view. And actually I'm also going to now offset by normal here is exactly what it says. It's just a little different because of how curves work. Curves have a normal that is along a single axis. And so if you choose to offset it by normal, your curve is quite literally, it's going to only be offset along the normal direction. And this does matter um, depending on the tilt. So if your tilt is different along your curve, the tilt is gonna change. And also because each curve is technically an individual, um, the tilt is going to change for each and every one. So it's a little bit of a very fine use case thing, but I figured it'd be useful to just have it in there if you need it. Now, instance count is pretty self-explanatory. It's the amount of instances that you have on these curves. Uh, I'm gonna turn up the amount of curves, and I'm also going to turn up the curve noise a little bit just so we can see this better. And I think I like that. Now there's two values down here, which I'm gonna go over before auto speed. Offset is the exact same as offsetting in a curve modifier. It's just offset their position along the curve. Object spread is a bit different because as you can see here, they're spread across a range of values, which is just the factor of the curve. And the factor of a curve is just a zero to one value from the start to the end point right here. This object spread is how wide a range of values it's allowed to be spread upon. Now, if we set this to one and we have our offset at zero, now we can see it's spread from zero to one. And if I increase this, now they're spread past the one, which can work for a variety of reasons, which I'll get into in a second. I'm gonna leave the object spread to one and I'm going to click auto animate. So now if I press play, they're going to automatically animate. Auto speed is a bit of a funky value only because it's the opposite of what you would think it does because I haven't found a way to correctly inverse the math, but that's fine. What auto speed means is how many frames is it gonna take for one object to get from one end of the curve to the other from a factor of zero to one. So if I turn that frame number down, they're obviously going to get to the end in a shorter amount of time. And if I want it to be slower, it's gotta be a bigger number. Now I'm gonna turn the auto speed down a little bit so we can see some more of the animation a little faster. So now I'm gonna go over these checkboxes down here. Uh, continuous allows the instances to just completely continue on the path that they were on. Same thing as the curve modifier. Uh, if I turn the noise down to zero so we can just see them follow just the base curve, you can see they're just going on in their direction. It's the same thing as a curve modifier where if you go past the curve, it kind of just keeps going. I figured it'd be helpful to have this. Now, if I turn off continuous and I turn on cyclic, it allows the instances to cycle along the path and kind of keep going. Now, the one thing this doesn't work for is if you have a project that needs motion blur, because when these objects are moving and they reach the end of the curve, they get jumped back to the end. And when Blender sees that in its motion curves or motion vectors, I mean, um, it's gonna calculate that as a gigantic jump from here to the very back of the curve. And you're gonna see that as a motion blur streak and it's gonna look really ugly. Um, the workaround for that is you turn off cyclic, you turn on terminate, and you just increase the object spread by a bunch so that now they terminate when they hit the end 
but they're not going to create a motion blur streak and you're just going to have to use a bunch of instances along that path that kind of extend past the bounds of the zero to one range it's a little weird i know i want to find a fix for it but this is the workaround that works right now so i'm going to turn off terminate i'm going to turn cyclic back on and i'm also going to make the actual curve cyclic by just clicking right click in the edit mode menu and toggle cyclic. So you can see that it works with any type of curve, whether it be cyclic or non-cyclic, which just means a loop or not a loop. Scale, we've already gone over scale. Rotation is a bit of an odd value. Uh, some of these are at least. So I'm going to first increase the curve noise and I'm actually just gonna make this a bit bigger so we can kind of see what's going on. Cool, that's great. So rotation noise scale. So by default, what this is doing is as the objects move along, they're moving through a field of noise texture. Now, rote noise scale is the rotation noise texture scale. So if I increase the scale a lot here, you can see that they jumble really fast. Uh, I usually keep this lower just because it keeps the rotation to be nice and kind of floaty or smooth. And actually, I'm going to lower the instance count because it's kind of bugging out right now. Now, I'm going to turn up the auto speed and make it go slower just so you can kind of see the rotation values a bit better because typically playback is pretty good on this, but I have a lot of OBS stuff running, so it's going a little slower. If we turn the rotation noise scale up, you'll be able to see how they move a lot faster or with a lot more variation over time. If they keep it lower, it's a bit smoother. Um, rotation noise axis effect is pretty self-explanatory. What it does is it's the axis that it is allowed to affect its rotation on. So if I want the noise texture to only rotate its x-axis, I will just turn the other ones to zero and they only rotate on their local x. Now if I turn it all off, they keep their orientation from their original collection. So now rotation override doesn't do anything by itself. What it allows is it allows you to input specific rotations into here in the override rotation and it lets you manually animate them on their uh, local axis. So if I wanted something to animate along the x-axis, I can open a timeline here and I can have manual control over it if I just put a keyframe in here and then I go to 120 and I'll make this 50, set another keyframe, make sure these are interpolated correctly. And if I play, you can see now they are animated on their local x-axis by keyframes, not automatically. So you have manual control over them. Uh, another thing I have is follow tangent, and it can get a little wacky only because of how tangents are calculated in geometry nodes. I think this is best explained if I have something that is kind of long and skinny, so you can see how this is actually working. So I'm going to add this to our bits collection and now, if I turn on follow tangent in here, you can see it's following the direction of the curve that they're sitting on. So if I go to debug view, I'm going to turn the curve count down. You can see that these long rectangles are actually following the curves that they're on. So by default, they follow the path relatively well. However, just due to how auto oilers are calculated in geometry nodes, Sometimes the object will kind of be following the path and then do this really fast, like it'll turn. That doesn't happen all the time. It's more likely to happen if you have a curve that is really, really wacky. Like if I bend this over here and I bend this down here, you're more likely to get those kind of insane rotations that happen. Um, also, you can see that the um, speed is not directly determined by the path evenly. It's determined between points individually. So you can see that the factor gets kind of compressed when I have all of these curve points in here really close. And then it's a lot longer out here. So do keep in mind that when you use auto animate or just move along its factor, the factor is not determined only by its length. It also takes into account where each point on the curve is. Now the last control in here is user scale control. This is the only thing that you will need to open the geometry nodes tab for. It is at the very end of this very scary looking node tree. Um, and all it is, is it's a curve. 
So if I make the scale of these objects a lot bigger, you'll be able to see this a bit better. And actually, I am going to decimate this curve and make this a little easier to look at because now it's kind of a mess. Awesome. So now what user scale control does is all it is is just a curve from zero to one based on its factor and it lets you adjust the scale of the instances as they move along the path. So if I take a point down here and I move it down, now our scale goes to zero as it gets to the middle and then as it reaches the end here, it goes back to one. If I wanted it to vary along its path, this is how you would do that. You can just add some bumps here, Let's say one and then zero. So now they kind of range in and out between zero and one along different points on the curve. Now, one side note is that you can also control the curve noise on a per point basis. So if I click one of these points and say I want it to be more spread out on this one in particular, all you have to do is it's the same controls as making a curve thicker. So you just hit Alt S and there you go. You've just made that point bigger. And you can see in the debug view that it is scaling those accordingly. So I can take whichever point I want and scale that with Alt S. This is future me because I realized that I forgot to go over how the material override works. So very quickly, there are two settings down at the bottom uh, called Matte Override and then one is a material input. Now Matte Override is just going to tell it override the material that the pieces that you're using already have and use this material instead. Uh, it's pretty simple to use, but what most people might not know is that you can actually use it as a override to add random colors to each object. So if I make this material here, uh, we'll call it Rand. Now if I select that material in the override, now it's overriding all of the objects. But if I shift A and search for attribute, we want type instancer, not geometry. Typically in geometry, no, just geometry, but this one is uses instancer. And then you just type rand call uh, with the proper capitals uh, because it's a variable name and it's very specific. And you just plug the color into the base color and then you have random colors for each thing. Now you can turn this into grayscale so you have random black and white values. Basically you have a random RGB or vector value for each object that you can access in the shader tree. And I think that about covers all the controls in Curve Flow. I know it can be a lot to take in for the first time, especially if you haven't used geometry nodes before. I know it can be a lot to take in for the first time, especially if you haven't used geometry nodes before. I tried to make it as user-friendly as possible, but if you ever have any questions or are confused on how a certain part works or it's just not working, feel free to reach out and let me know. I'm gonna try and make a video in the future explaining how Curveflow actually works and kind of how I built it, just for the more advanced Geometry Nodes users if you're interested. But for now, thank you very much for downloading Curveflow and hopefully I'll see you next time.